In this video, we're going to talk informally a little bit about vectors. Now, vectors are something that you probably already have some intuition for from like high school physics class, right? There are often things that we sort of write with, uh, say, you know, like little arrows above them like that or like that. And typically, we think of these as being directed line segments. Maybe we have some two-dimensional space and we have a line with a little arrow to represent a direction and a magnitude. Now, these are things that we think quite a lot about as representing, say, forces or velocities of various kinds. So maybe a typical kind of thing would be where we have like an inclined plane, right? And maybe there's a block and the block is subject to some kind of gravity and maybe it slides down with some kind of velocity and maybe there's some frictional force that's holding it back. Now these are useful intuitive ideas for reasoning about two and three dimensions and thinking about physical systems. But the kind of the key property that we care about here is going to be the idea that we can add them together and scale them. And those properties are going to turn out to generalize to lots of other kinds of objects that we'll still call vectors. And these kinds of vectors form the basis of many different kinds of things that we do in machine learning. They're kind of a core object for reasoning about high dimensional spaces and how we can combine things and featureize things and so on. So just to remind you how this works, we can think of things sort of geometrically and we can also think of things algebraically. The geometric view is really useful and it's very helpful for thinking about things in two and three dimensions, but it doesn't necessarily generalize to higher dimensions, but the algebraic view does. So just to remind you, if I have some vector say x and I want to add it to some vector y, then of course what I do is I just put them head to tail, right? geometrically. And this gives me a new vector that I'll call x plus y. Similarly, if I want to scale something, maybe I want to scale it by some, uh, by some quantity, let's call it gamma, then if I have an x hat that's some vector, and then I multiply it by some gamma, then I get some new thing that might be shorter or longer, but is pointing in the same direction. The way these things work out algebraically is pretty straightforward, and it's exactly what you'd expect, which is to say that if we have some, if we have some components, right, so we would typically say that maybe x is equal to some amount in the y i hat in the i hat direction plus some b in the j hat direction, and then y is equal to, say, some c in the i-hat direction and some d in the j-hat direction, then we can do the same operations, but we kind of do them by manipulating these quantities, right? So now x-hat, sorry, x, uh, the vector x plus y is equal to a plus c i-hat, and then we add that to the b and d j hat. And similarly, if I want to multiply x by some constant gamma, then that's just going to wind up being inside the each component. So I'll wind up with some gamma times a i hat plus gamma times b j hat. Right, so i and j are sort of our designations for these unit vectors that give the a and the b and the c and d kind of different meanings. Now it turns out that the geometric view of vectors as directed line segments is a little bit limiting. So what we want to do, part of what we want to do in this class is go beyond directed line segments. So what does that mean? Well, what we want to do is think about different kinds of objects that belong to some set and for which we can take two objects of that set, add them together and get another object in that set. That is to say we want to have vectors be able to add, and we also want them to still be able to scale. So we want to think broadly about other kinds of objects in which it's possible to add them together, and it's also possible to scale them. And so there are three ingredients generally that we're going to look for when we talk about other kinds of vectors. So these ingredients are we need a set, We need addition, 
and we also are going to need multiplication by a scalar. And kinds of things that have those properties, we're going to treat those as vectors. And these will be interesting algebraic objects that won't necessarily translate to simple kinds of directed line segments. Now the, the easiest way to go is to directly generalize the high school physics type vectors that we, that we just looked at. And instead of just thinking about them as being, say, pairs or triplets of numbers for two and three dimensions, to think about them as being arbitrary tuples of some size n. So one natural thing to do is to think about lists of numbers as being a vector space. So we could think about some kind of vector, let's call it x, and I'm going to, in general in this class, write this, uh, write vectors with a single line beneath them. We could say that a vector x is an x1 and an x2 and then out to some xn, right? So just a list of real numbers. Each of these x's, say xi, is a real number. And we'll write that by saying it's a member of the set of real numbers. This double struck r is the set of real numbers. So then if we want to talk about tuples of n real numbers, we could talk about this x, this vector x, as living in Rn. It's a little bit hard to think about this in n dimensions because we may not have much intuition for directed line segments in more than three dimensions. But algebraically, this still makes sense and we can still do the same kind of thing we would do in two or three dimensions. So if we have some x that's like that and then a y that's defined similarly, then we could say that something like x plus y is equal to the set of tuples that is going to be x1 plus y1 and then x2 plus y2 and so on. Also, algebraically, we need to be able to scale things. And so just as before, if I wanted to talk about some gamma where gamma uh, is a real number, and I wanted to multiply that by some vector x, then exactly as in our sort of intuitive directed line segment view, then we get gamma times x1, gamma times x2, and so on. Now this feels, of course, like a direct generalization of the kinds of objects that you're already used to, and that's good because we spend a lot of time thinking about Rn. But it's worth realizing that vectors can be more complicated objects. So let me give you one example of how we can generalize our interpretation of what a vector is. Let's think about functions. In particular, let's think about cubic polynomials. So let's imagine that we have some function, let's call it az. And we're going to talk about the coefficients of az as being, let's say, a0 plus a1z plus a2z squared plus a3z cubed. Now let's imagine that we have a second function that's defined almost exactly the same way. Let's call this bz. And this is going to be b0 plus b1z plus b2z squared plus b3z cubed, right? And we can immediately see that adding these things together adds the coefficients exactly as we'd expect. That is to say that if we think about a z as a vector object plus b z, right, then what are we going to get? We're going to get something that looks like a0 plus b0 plus a1 plus b1 z, right, plus a squared plus, sorry, plus a2 plus b2 z squared plus finally a3 plus b3 z cubed. So that's cool. So we have a way to take two of these kinds of objects and add them together, and then we get another object of the same type. So we could think of our set z here as being the set of cubic polynomials. Similarly, we can scale these things, and they operate in the way that we'd expect. Right? So we could take our gamma that we've been 
using, and we could talk about gamma times az, right? And then, as before, we get gamma a0 plus gamma a1z, and so on. And it behaves exactly as we'd expect. And so from a sort of computational point of view, this means that we can treat these, uh, these coefficients as points in R4, right? There's four numbers that matter here. Um, but we can interpret these vectors and interpret the sort of algebra over these vectors as manipulating these, these functions with a more complicated interpretation. And where things get really cool is that it turns out that you can generalize this to situations that have an unbounded number of coefficients. In fact, we could think of this as being the arbitrary set of polynomials in which all of the higher order terms are all just, all just have zero coefficients. And all of this math would still push through essentially, right? Because they're all zeros, we would just be adding those, uh, all of those zeros together and they would stay zero. Now, we're not gonna talk about these kinds of infinite dimensional vector spaces in this course, but in future courses about machine learning, especially kind of more advanced things, there is really interesting infinite dimensional objects that it turns out that you can manipulate with finite amounts of computation. And if you've ever heard of something like a kernel or a support vector machine, that's often the kind of thing that, um, that we're talking about. I'd like to give you two more examples that might help you think a little bit more broadly about what a vector is. The first is just to think of a color as being a vector. You're used to the idea of there being RGB colors for red, green, and blue, and you can think of those three numbers as being the components of a color vector. We can scale any given color and make it lighter or darker, and of course we can add them and blend together different colors. Here I'm showing a few random scaled sums of the red, green, and blue vectors. Sounds give us another example of something that we can think of as a vector. We can add together and scale sound waveforms to make a single piece of music from individual instruments. Here's a simple example that I recorded. I've pulled this into Python Colab as a NumPy vector and we can actually listen to it here. From the computer's point of view, this really is just a big list of numbers. And so if we want, we could plot the waveform like I'm doing here. This is actually a sum of eight different instruments and eight different waveforms. I'm plotting each of them separately here. And of course we can listen to each of these separately. If we think of these as being vectors, then we can scale and add these different eight instruments in order to make new vectors with new compositions. So let's weight them with random numbers and then add them up and see what we get. The point of this isn't that you would actually make music this way, so much as to just sort of illustrate the idea that vectors can take different kinds of forms and have different kinds of meanings beyond just directed line segments.